Good afternoon, everybody, or evening, or whatever applies to you. Thanks a lot for joining us today. My name is Carlos Muñoz Perez, and I'm an associate adjunct professor at the Universidad Austral de Chile. I'll be the host slash moderator for today's Abralin Ovivo session. Abralin Ovivo Linguists Online is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Today, we'll have a presentation on case theory by Thomas McFadden. Arguably, this could be all the presentation we need, since if you're interested in case theory, the chances are that you're already familiar with Thomas McFadden's work. He obtained his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in 2004 with an outstanding dissertation on the relation or lack of relation between morphological case and nominal licensing, a proposal, a proposal that, I can say, has been very influential for grammatical studies in Latin America. After obtaining his PhD, Thomas has become a leading researcher in theoretical linguistics. His work encompasses research on comparative syntax, the syntax morphology interface, historical linguistics, and computational methods in linguistics. Currently, he, is an, he has a position as senior researcher at SAS Berlin. The title of his talk today is The Structural Inherent Case Distinction and Implementation of Dependent Case. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for being here with us today. You can start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Carlos, for the uh, very nice introduction. Uh, and thanks to uh, Aberlin for the invitation. I'm very excited about this. Uh, thanks also to Michelle for uh, agreeing to come and be the discussant. Uh, I'm really excited in, about uh, talking with her also about what I'm going to be presenting today. So let me share my screen here. And I can gradually get started. So uh, I'll just say one thing while I have this up here. There are, are links, um, short uh, URLs here. If you want to get the handout or the, the slides that I'm going to be presenting here, I think they'll be made available in the chat uh, as well. Uh, but in case you want to grab them from this way, if you want to be able to page back and forth, the slides in the handout have exactly the same content, just formatted differently. So. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today has a sort of long background. Um, there are several decades of theoretical work on uh, a couple of different distinct ideas about case that have emerged as alternatives to what I'm going to be calling standard case theory. Um, and I'm going to be, be sort of comparing and working on bringing together these two alternatives in the talk today. The first alternative I'm going to call SISM that's short for case is morphological. This is the idea that, that case really is a purely morphological thing. It's based on syntactic structure, but it comes in too late to affect the syntactic derivation. Um, this is something that, that I proposed in my dissertation following earlier work by Morantz and Harley and, and, and a number of other people. Uh, an alternative idea I'm gonna call KP. This says that uh, cases are not just features on noun heads or determiner heads or DPs or anything like that. Instead, they represent their own syntactic projections, right? K heads, KP, head, uh, KP structures. Um, also an idea that's been associated with a number of different people with very different ideas uh, over the years. Now, these two ideas uh, seem to be incompatible and I'm, I'm going to explain later exactly why they seem incompatible but I'm going to actually be exploring the idea that the, the best theory of morphological case ultimately um, should incorporate the two ideas together and the idea is to map the, the these two different approaches onto the divide between uh, what are often called structural and inherent cases and if we do this right um, we not only get a, a better account of the structural inherent distinction than has been available up until now, but also we can handle some phenomena that straddle the divide between structural and inherent case and have often been a bit problematic from, uh, from that perspective. And we also get some nice insights into some comparative and diachronic patterns. I'm probably not gonna get to the comparative and diachronic patterns today, but if you're interested, they are there at the end of the handout and slides. Um, so I'm going to start off here with a very quick crash course on the distinction between structural and inherent case. This is the main empirical background for what I'm going to be talking about. This is a distinction that um, is something we, we all learn relatively early in our career as tacticians. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time um, going through the data. There's a lot of, of, of detail in the handout, which um, we can go back to for discussion. I'm going to sort of zip through this and basically list off the main differences as, a, as a, something that we can talk about 
to see how those differences can be accounted for by the proposal that I'm going to make. So this, this basic distinction between structural and inherent case goes back um, to the beginnings of, 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 of tradition of case theory within generative grammar and ultimately goes back to even older distinctions uh, involving terms like oblique and so forth um, that go back into traditional grammar. The basic idea within uh, generative case theory, we can sum up sort of like this. Structural case is determined by and sensitive to the configurational syntactic environment where we find a DP and nothing else, right? Inherent case, on the other hand, is determined by and sensitive to semantic and lexical factors, potentially in addition to configurational factors like structural case, right? Um, so now uh, I've got a list here of, uh, of six um, detailed ways in which this, this structural inherent distinction comes about the way that you, you look at a case in a particular language and try to decide, is this a structural case or an inherent case? I've got sort of, they, they basically elaborate on this, this definitional distinction here. Uh, and I'm gonna go through them again very quickly. And then we can come back to this later um, in the question period or, or, or if there's discussion about any of the details. Um, so the first difference uh, is that inherent case is thematically and lexically restricted while structural case is assigned purely on the basis of structural configuration. So if a DP is gonna get a structural case, all you need to know is what syntactic position it's in, what else is going on in the syntactic structure. But if inherent cases involved, you might need to take into account things like the identity of a lexical verb or the semantics or the thematic role of the DP. I'm just skipping, there's a lot of German data here that we can, that, to, to exemplify all of this, but I'm going to skip over it for, uh, for time reasons so that we can get to the actual proposals. Second difference between structural and inherent case, when you've got a DP that's in a, a, a position where it could in principle be assigned either an inherent case or a structural case, the inherent case takes precedence over the structural one, right? Um, the, the evidence for this is, is slightly trickier to go into, but it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty clear in languages where you see this. Um, uh, inherent cases typically show up in contexts where there would have been uh, a structural case available if, for example, you had chosen a different verb. And it's always the inherent case that shows up. Third one, this is the, the diagnostic that's most commonly used if you're looking at a new language to try to decide, is this case structural or inherent? Uh, structural cases, cases undergo systematic alternations with each other um, in contexts of A movement or argument structure modification. Um, inherent cases don't. So the sort of classic example of this, um, structural accusative becomes structural nominative if you passivize uh, a clause, whereas inherent dative stays dative. Fourth difference, which is somewhat related to the third one, is that um, DPs with inherent case are often blocked from cert participating in certain syntactic uh, relationships, especially ones related with subjecthood. Right. Um, so in German, uh, a DP that's marked with inherent case cannot become the subject of a clause, right? Whereas a DP that's marked with structural case um, can either be the subject or can become the subject if you do appropriate manipulations to the argument structure. Um, there are conditions under which you can play with things to make datives turn into uh, uh, subjects, subject nominatives e even in, in German, but they re it requires doing a bit more work. In a language like Icelandic, um, inherent case marked DPs are still allowed to become subjects, right? And this is a classic series of, of distinctions between German and Icelandic and various other languages showing you that you can get in Icelandic things like dative subjects. Um, this difference between languages like German and Icelandic is these are differences among the inherent cases, right? This is sort of separate from structural case. And here it's largely a terminological uh, point at this uh, that I want to make here. When you have inherent case that does not block these syntactic processes, that does not block subjecthood, then we call it quirky case. Okay, um, fifth difference between structural and inherent, and this one I'll spend slightly more time on because it's very important for what we're going to talk about going forward. Um, if a DP has um, inherent case or structural case, that, that choice between the two can affect 
the case that's assigned to other DPs in its environment. So the clearest example here, the easiest example to talk about from something like German, if you have a nominative accusative language and you have a two place clause, right? A transitive clause. If the higher argument in the transitive clause gets a structural case, the lower argument will get structural accusative. If the higher argument gets an inherent case, then the lower argument will get structural nominative, right? So whether the lower argument, whether the object in a transitive clause gets nominative or accusative depends on whether the subject, let's say, has a structural case or an inherent case, right? So a structural case counts for other structural cases, inherent case doesn't. We'll talk about that in some detail later because this is the set of facts that motivates a lot of what, what's done in independent case theory. And uh, finally, um, inherent case mark DPs generally, usually uh, with some variation, are blocked from triggering fire agreement, whereas structural case mark ones often are not blocked. They often can trigger fire agreement. Okay, that's a baseline of distinctions between the two. Um, this is what we ultimately want to try to account for. And um, to get to that distinction, I now want to go back to bigger picture stuff and talk about different theoretical approaches to case, okay? Now, um, the standard view uh, in government binding theory, minimalism uh, is, has, has been uh, the entire time that cases are features assigned to or checked on DPs in the course of the syntactic derivation, All right? Notice that I have bold-faced features in syntactic because those, those points are gonna be relevant for what I talk about in a second. Now, the fact that case involves features that are assigned in the syntactic derivation, that means that um, these case features can potentially influence the course of the syntactic derivation after case assignment, right? And so one of the crucial roles that case has always played in standard case theory is that it's been used to trigger or license uh, or block a movement, passivization, control, et cetera. Now, here I'm gonna consider two alternative ideas about case, like alternatives to standard case theory. And these two alternatives move in um, opposite directions from the assumptions of standard case theory um, by modifying one of the, right in this, I said here in this definition, I've highlighted two bits, features and syntactic. The two approaches that I wanna um, consider here, each modify way. one of these two things. So the SISM approach modifies the syntactic bit. So it moves case from the syntax into the morphology um, such that it interprets the structure output by the syntax rather than playing an active role in its derivation, right? SISM says case takes the output of the syntax and figures out case on that basis rather than case being something that's done within the syntax. KP, goes in the opposite direction. It makes case even more syntactic. It reifies cases as heads or a series of heads rather than just being features on other heads. Okay, okay. so these are the two things that I'm gonna be contrasting. And, and in order to contrast them, of course, we need to understand why, why people propose them in the first place. What, what's the motivation for these two um, alternatives? And uh, I'm gonna abbreviate standard case theory henceforth as SCT. Okay, so the big idea of standard case theory, and this goes back to this famous letter that uh, Jean-Roger Vergniaud wrote to uh, Chomsky and Lasnik in 77. Um, the idea here is that DPs need to be, uh, they need case in order to be licensed. And licensed means uh, at least meant for the, for, the, for the first long period of, of, of case theory um, that they're allowed to appear overtly. And if a DP can't get a case in a particular structural position, then it'll be forced to move to another position where it can get case. Or if it stays where it started out, it has to remain silent, in particular as big pro. Right? So that's going to happen in non-finite clauses, for example. Um, now, this idea, notice this, this on its own has nothing to do with morphological case. This is just something that case was being used for. The idea was that morphological case correlates with this licensing property. And since this licensing property, property clearly involves syntactic operations like movement, right? that 
implied that case would have to be something that's active in the narrow syntactic component, right? So if case is, is really is involved in licensing, then case has to be syntactic. But subsequent work, going back almost, almost all the way back to when, when Vernier first proposed this and Chomsky worked it out in the early 80s, um, a lot of work since then has turned up a whole series of problems with this basic idea, with the, the idea that you want to tie the positional distribution of DPs to the determination of their morphological case, right? And um, here again, I'm going, to, I'm going to basically mention the arguments. I'm not going to go into detail on them because this is, this is summarizing a, a long existing literature. These are not, I have no new points to make here. I'm just sort of giving this to you as background. But again, I've got some detail on the arguments here in the handouts and slides if you want to um, double check them. So the, the first point is that the relationship between final A positions, right? The positions the DPs end up in after they've done all of their A movement, right? The relationship between those positions and morphological cases is not actually one-to-one, -one, which is what a naive version of, 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 of standard case theory would lead us to expect, but are actually many-to-many. -many. And the original evidence from this for this comes from Icelandic, but you can replicate it for lots of languages. The short version of it is if you look around in these languages, you get um, things like uh, datives showing up in sub in the in the canonical subject position, which, are, which is no distinct, no no different structurally from the nom the the place where nominative sub subjects show up. And similarly, you can get nominative objects in a place where you expect accusatives. The second argument is that you can get case assigned. In the sense of Vernier licensing, sorry, sorry, let me let me start again. You can get case assigned, you can get morphological case clearly being assigned to a DP in a context where it's not actually licensed to be overt. All right. Again, arguments originally from Icelandic, but they've been replicated for a number of languages. The, the basic pattern here is that you can get things like you can you can show clearly that in certain contexts, something has to be pr big pro, right? You, a DP is not allowed to be overt. You obligatorily have a silent element, right? The sort of thing that case theory tells us should mean the lack of case. But actually you can tell by looking at um, agreeing secondary predicates and things like that, uh, that, um, that, that, that DP actually has received a morphological case. You just can't hear it because it's silent. And the, uh, the third argument is that um, DPs can be licensed, right? So you get Vernier licensing without the assignment of morphological case. The argument here is slightly more subtle, but this has to do with the phenomenon of default case. Um, you can show that in the vast majority of languages that have a morphological case system, there's some morphological case that is the default that shows up in um, all sorts of different places, including places where um, you have things like syntactic fragments or dislocated material that shows that the DP is not connected syntactically to the rest of the clause in a typical way. And if you set things up right, you can actually show normal case assignment rules failing in that context. And what happens is the DPs are not ruled out. They're still allowed to be there. They're still allowed to be pronounced, but the case that they show up is a default. They show up in lots of languages. They'll show up, for example, with nominative. Right, uh, and Schutze, uh, Carson Schutze worked on this for his dissertation in a related paper and a bunch of other people have talked about it since. And the, the argument here is basically that if case, if morphological case can be supplied as a default, then it can't possibly be involved in licensing because um, otherwise the case filter would be rendered vacuous. Otherwise every DP that, would, that doesn't get case would get default case and therefore every DP would automatically get licensing, licensed. So, these, these three arguments, basically, um, you can sum up like this. Case and licensing um, don't line up with each other. And you can get case without licensing. And you can get licensing without case. Okay. So what all of this means is that, uh, contra what Vigneault suggested in his letter and what, what standard case theory has, has assumed, um, at least from at, at least initially, we have to actually keep the positional distribution of overt DPs separate from the determination of morphological case. Now, one thing that that means is that we need a different approach to the distribution of overt DPs, something other than 
case theory, or at least something other than um, case theory in a, in, a, in a way that relates to morphological cases. I have lots of ideas about, um, about what that, that approach could look like, um, but that's a subject for a different talk. You can take a look at some of the citations in the slides, this slide here. Um, among other things, I think something like the EPP plays the most important role. That's an idea that goes back at least to Morantz 91. Um, and then you also need a little bit of extra work to deal with uh, um, the weirdness of overtness, which is a phonological property interacting with syntactic properties. What's more important for our concerns today is that if we don't need case assignment for DP licensing, right? If morphological case assignment is not involved in DP licensing, then we've lost the strongest motivation that we had for assuming that case assignment was syntactic, right? That was the argument. If we need, if we, if case is involved in Vergniaud licensing, then case must be a syntactic thing. We've seen that case is not involved in licensing. So we've lost that argument for being syntactic. There are, can be other arguments for saying that morphological case should be syntactic, but this traditional main one is gone. Okay. Um, and we can sort of pile on to this with um, a couple of uh, additional points here. Um, one is that, that we're gonna talk about um, a fair amount in the course of this talk. One is that the assignment of, of some cases um, involves a dependency or seems to involve a dependency with additional DP, right? This is the traditional uh, dependent case idea. And the thing with this is that it's very difficult to implement that in terms of standard syntactic operations like agree. Right, which makes it a little bit harder to see how to make it syntactic. Um, the second point is that uh, the determination of specific cases doesn't actually seem to inform the semantics the way that we would expect it to if specific cases were determined in the syntax, because then things like nominative, accusative, dative, genitive would be part of the input to, the L to LF, and we might expect LF to care about that. But there's a lot of evidence that LF doesn't really care so much about specific case categories, right? So um, this, all of this, we added up, up this, this leads to the motivation for SISM. So if we've moved case assignment, if we move case assignment into the PF branch, then we, um, we can make sense of this cluster of facts and avoid making problematic predictions like um, the expectation that case should affect semantics. Okay, so that's, that's the motivation for why uh, people like Marantz and uh, myself proposed something like SISM, saying that morphological case belongs in the morphology, in the post-syntactic component, not in the narrow syntax. Now, how about the other idea, the KP idea? So there's several different arguments out here, and there are arguments of very different kinds, right? The, the number of people who have proposed that case involves a syntactic head have done so for very, very different reasons based on different languages in different stages of the theory. Uh, so I can't go into all of those here. I'm going to pick out one kind of argument, um, which I find very interesting, um, and uh, partly because it 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 um, it relates to the actual morphology in a very interesting way. Um, these are arguments that come from uh, particularly from work by Pavel Saha. There's a lot of other uh, work that's built on this. And what Saha in his dissertation and subsequent work did is he, he took um, a, a proposal uh, of a hierarchy of cases that goes back at least to uh, Blake's handbook uh, on case, like 2001. So there's this, this hierarchy of cases. This is basically a markedness hierarchy. And, and what the version in 16 is specifically for nominative accusative languages. Uh, ergative absolutive languages are a bit different but the basic pattern is quite similar. Um, so basically, nominative is the least marked, accusative is a bit more marked, genitive is a bit more marked than that, et cetera. What Saha argues uh, is that this hierarchy isn't just about markedness. It's not just about what's most common or how, how heavy the morphology is or anything like that. There's two other sets of cross-linguistic facts that this hierarchy uh, captures or can, can be used to capture. The first is that if a language has a given morphological case, it will also have all of the other cases to the left as morphological cases. So if, if the language has morphological dative case, it will also have genitive, accusative, and nominative. Right? Um, there are a bunch of important caveats here. 
I'm sure most, a lot of people out there can think of obvious counterexamples to this, um, but the, they, they can generally be dealt with by the relevant caveats. Second set of facts is that within a single language, syncretisms overwhelmingly involve contiguous regions of the hierarchy. And this is the thing that, that Saha spent most of his dissertation talking about and which has been extremely influential, um, not just for work on case, but for other work on patterns of syncretism uh, in other languages going forward. So the, we can demonstrate this uh, most easily with a language that has three cases. So modern Greek has nominative, accusative, and genitive. And if you look at the various uh, various words in the language that make case distinctions, right? Nouns, pronouns, etc. Um, you'll find ones where uh, nominative and accusative are syncretic. So we see that with the plural of fighters. You also find ones where accusative and genitive are syncretic. We see that in the singular fighter. Um, and we also have a few that are syncretic for all three cases, like the word alpha, the name of the letter. What you don't find are patterns where nominative and genitive are syncretic to the exclusion of the accusative, where you have a distinct accusative form and, and, and a syncretic form for nominative and genitive. And this is not a fact about modern Greek. This is a fact apparently about the vast majority of languages that have case systems. You can line up their cases in an order like the hierarchy here, and you will not find um, non-contiguous syncretisms among those cases. And what Taha proposes in order to deal with this is a particular expanded version of the KP hypothesis where you don't just have a single K head. Instead, the different cases, different case categories are distinguished by involving different amounts of K heads, different numbers of heads above the DP. So the nominative is a minimal amount of structure above the DP. The accusative is the nominative plus an additional head. The genitive is that plus one more head, et cetera, et cetera. And if you if you take that um, if you take this this kind of uh, of structure, you and you uh, you put it together with an appropriate theory of morphosyntax, um, you can explain the two sets of facts. You can explain the inventory facts, and you can explain the syncretism facts. The syncretism facts basically fall out um, because of the way that elsewhere. Uh, uh, and, and under specification gen typically work in theories of morphosyntax. Um, and the argumentation, the way that Saha sets it up, you, you can in principle do this by assuming just sets of features, bundles of features on, on a single DP head, but it's much, much harder. It, it, this, the argumentation works best here if you assume that these are real syntactic structures. And therefore these can't just be features on a single DP, they have to be a series of individual heads. And hence we have a version of KP. Okay, so those are the two alternatives that I'm gonna be comparing here. And um, I've given you a very quick introduction to both. Uh, you have to sort of trust me a bit, um, or at least I suggest that you should trust me a bit that each of these are motivated. SISM and KP are each motivated by a set of facts that they can handle better than standard case theory. All right. um, Unfortunately, the two ideas are incompatible with each other. So it, it, it seems like we might want to say, okay, let's we'll ditch standard case theory and we'll we'll take SISM and we'll take KP. Right. Um, the problem is that they don't they don't actually work together in an obvious way. It would be incoherent to say that a DP has no case in the syntax. That's the SISM idea, and also is embedded in an exploded KP, which is the syntactic representation of its case. That's the KP idea, right? Those two things don't fit together. They they are um, they are opposed to each other. So we can't have both, but actually we don't want to have just one of them because if we look a bit more closely, each of the two ideas, if you take them by, by on their own, they have non-trivial problems. So SISM um, has fairly limited ability to deal with the syncretism and inventory patterns that Saha talked about. You can describe the patterns very nicely uh, but you can't explain them particularly well. You can't, it's very difficult to get a, a really working uh, explanation of the cross-linguistic consistency in the patterns that you get. Um, and I, I, I say this with a, a fair amount of confidence because I tried for uh, several years during and after my dissertation to do it and I never was satisfied with it. Right? This is one of the reasons why I think KP is quite useful. It was able, it's able to explain things that I couldn't do um, with the tools that I had beforehand. Um, it also, SISM also doesn't have 
that much insightful to say about the inherent cases, especially the more substantive inherent cases that tend to have more clear semantics, things like locatives or in a language like Finnish, you know, like an allative or an illative, which has a very specific uh, semantic uh, associated with it. KP, on the other hand, um, has the problem that it predicts, right? If, if, if the cases, if each case is defined by a particular collection of syntactic heads, um, we predict that there should be some sort of consistent semantic contribution from each of those heads, right? Um, it might be a very, very minor semantics, but there should be something there, right? And that kind of works for, again, things like allatives or, 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 or translatives or, or cislocatives or whatever you want to call them um, from a language that has an elaborate case system. But for the cases low on the hierarchy, even in a language like Finnish, for nominative, accusative, things like that, you really don't get any kind of consistent semantics that you could map on, you'd be happy to map onto an individual syntactic head. Uh, the other problem that KP suffers from, it, it, has, it has all of the same problems as standard case theory when it comes to accounting for the distribution of nominative and accusative case, for accounting for the uh, distribution of the structural cases, the same problems that uh, the work from languages like Icelandic uh, uh, brought up. So we have a bit of a puzzle here. But um, if we think about it, there's a pretty clear angle to approach it. We've got two approaches um, that um, each do something well, do something else poorly, don't seem to fit with each other. Um, the things that they do well on and do poorly on are more or less complementary, right? And I'm going to suggest they, the, the distinction here follows the structural inherent divide. And I'm going to develop this in some detail, but the basic idea now that this that I'm going to propose a synthesis that, that we'll spend the rest of the talk um, developing. The distinction between structural and inherent cases reflects a distinction in the size of the relevant nominal phrases. So nominal nominals that, that bear structural case are DPs in the narrow syntax, undifferentiated. The distinctions among the structural cases are determined at or after spell out. That's basically SISM. Right? On the other hand, nominals that bear inherent or oblique case are larger articulated KPs in the narrow syntax. Their distinct cases correspond to distinct amounts of structure within the KP. This is a version of the KP approach. Now, this is not entirely new. In fact, almost everything that I'm going to say here has been said somewhere else in some form or other. All right. Um, so I've got a bunch of citations here of, of various people who have proposed that some but not all DP, some but not all cases involve KP or, or PP or something else that's, that's uh, equivalent to it. Um, the novelty um, comes in, for one thing that I'm going to put together a bunch of different ideas that people have had to try to make one big coherent story. Right? And in particular, what I want to do is map the distinction between um, KP and not KP, between SISM and KP onto the structural inherent case divide. And um, the given some, some recent advances in, in both of the approaches and our general uh, understanding of syntax and the syntax morphology interface, we can actually, if we do this in the right way, we can actually derive a lot of the differences between structural and inherent case that used to be stipulated which is a, a nice thing. Um, the other thing that, uh, um, that this gives us that I think previous approaches really struggled with um, is it's gonna let us talk about cases that are intermediate between being structural and inherent. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that later so that you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. And these have to a certain extent been ignored. Uh, ignored is a bit strong. They haven't received a whole lot of attention in, in prior work. And um, I think the approach here gives us a way to deal with them. And again, um, it's going to give us something to say about comparative and diachronic issues, about the grammaticalization of case, about um, shifts uh, in a particular case from being uh, inherent to structural, about um, cases like uh, something that um, there's a really nice paper by Agnostopoulou and, um, and Christina Sevdali about uh, the development of different types of dative in the history of Greek, where at one stage, it looks like it's an inherent case. and another stage, it looks like it's a structural case. And this, this story gives us something that we can say about all of that. Um, 
that's at the end of the handout. And again, I'm probably not going to get to that, but that's just something that uh, you guys can take a look at later and ask questions about if you're interested. So the way that I'm going to do this for the inherent cases, at least as a starting point, we can take what Saha um, said in his dissertation. We'll have a bit more to say regarding the assign, what it means to assign inherent case um, a, a bit later, but the, the basic idea is more or less what, what Saha proposed. For the structural cases that we need a little bit more background because we haven't talked about this in detail yet. What I want to propose, um, again, following uh, a, a lot of prior work, is that the structural cases primarily and maybe exclusively involve what's uh, called dependent case and default or unmarked case, right? So the store, I'm not making use of, uh, of case assigned under, uh, under agree, for example. The basic idea of dependent case, um, which goes back to Moran's 91 with some important antecedents, uh, is summarized nicely in this, this definition from Baker's 2015 book. Um, so the idea is that you have a, this, this general possibility when you have two DPs, they can also be uh, maybe of slightly different sizes. You can have PPs potentially and in getting involved here. Um, I'll say later, you can have KPs involved here. If you have two of them in a C command relationship in a local domain, then you can assign a dependent case to one or the other of the two DPs. Right. So if a category XP bears C command relationship R to another category ZP in domain W, then assign case C to XP. So a simple example, imagine you've got two, P, two DPs, a subject and an object. The subject C commands the object, right? Um, and they're both in a domain, like let's say the CP phase, then you can assign a dependent accusative to the lower of the two, the lower of the two DPs. In this case, that'll be the object getting accused. This is a template though, right? So you can alter the categories of things involved here. You can alter the direction of the C command. So if you assign dependent case downward to the object, that might be accusative. If you assign it upward to the subject, that might be what we call ergative. Um, also, you can uh, play around with the domain in which this, this happens. So two DPs in the CP phase might be involved in one kind of relationship, two DPs in the little VP phase, Baker argues in that case, if you assign a dependent case upward, that's how you explain certain kinds of structural datives, right? Um, one thing that I'll point out here, um, you notice that these little examples that I've got, one type of accusative works like this, one type of dative works like that, one type of ergative works like that. Um, notice that type of accusative, type of dative, this should suggest to you that the label accusative doesn't really mean much. It's not a theoretically relevant term. These are pre-theoretical descriptive labels. And uh, Omer Preminger has a really nice paper that's to appear that talks a lot about how it's a bad thing that we tend to get confused about labels like accusative and dative and ergative. Really, we need to be talking about the theoretical mechanisms that are involved because two different accusatives could be assigned by rather different rules. Um, the nice thing about this system, and Baker's book works this out in a lot of detail, is that we can play around with that the rule in 19, the rule for dependent case, that were actually a template for a rule of case assignment. If we parameterize that in different ways, um, we can describe uh, or account for lots of different case systems cross-linguistically, especially if we let that interact with other aspects of the syntax of the languages involved. So uh, an example that comes from, uh, from Baker's work um, and, and his work together with Vino Korova. Um, if you have a language where the dependent case rule uh, assigns dependent case downward to the lower of two DPs inside the CP phase, right? Then in a, in a language where the object always raises up into, this, uh, into let's say an, an outer specifier of little VP, the rule is always going to be triggered in a transitive pause. You'll have the subject C commanding the object within the CP phase. The object will get dependent accusative. So in any transitive clause, you'll get nominative accusative. But if, but notice that that only works because the object has moved out of the little VP phase up into the CP phase to get local to the subject. If it doesn't move, then the rule can never apply because you won't ever have a single domain, a single phase that has two DPs in it. So neither one will get any kind of dependent case. And 
uh, Baker and Vinokurova, and then Baker in, in, in work on a number of other languages and several other people since then have, have argued that we can use this to explain um, what happens in languages with a certain kind of differential object marking. So this is sort of the classic example from uh, Saha from the Baker and Vinokurova 2010 paper. So the idea here is that if you look in 20, Masha ate porridge quickly. Porridge comes after the adverb quickly. Um, so it looks like porridge, the object porridge hasn't undergone any movement. And notice that it also doesn't have a case marker on it, right? And that makes sense if um, Masha and porridge would have to be local to each other in the same phase in order for the dependent case to happen. In 21, this is the, the, the alternate the other uh, half of the minimal pair, we have Masha ate the porridge quickly. And notice that now porridge comes to the left of the adverb, which among other things is taken as evidence that the object has raised out of the little VP phase into the CP phase. And notice that it also has accusative marking. So the idea is the object moves up, it gets local to the subject, that triggers the dependent case assignment rule. That movement is also associated, or that movement or the, the, the resulting position of the object is also associated with uh, interpretive differences. So that's why, in this case, we get definiteness or specificity, um, as is often associated with scrambling or object shift. But um, this, the fact that Saha has this optional object shift and it has this particular kind of dependent accusative rule lets us explain why it has this particular kind of differential object marking. Right. And then we can play around with these rules. We can have different versions of the rule in 19. We can also look at languages that different, have different patterns of movement, and we can use that to explain other kinds of case systems. So uh, Michelle uh, Yuan, who's, who's the, the discussant today, um, has some really nice work on um, the Inuit languages or Inuit varieties, which show a really interesting pattern of variation in ergativity patterns, right? So all of them have constructions that have an ergative absolutive case pattern, but they differ in how often that shows up and what the, under what context, under what uh, uh, um, conditions you get that pattern. And the idea that she has, we can sort of see it in 22 and 23. It's quite parallel to what, to what we just saw for Asaha. The difference is, so we, we have a subject and object starting out in separate phases, and then the object moves up. The difference that we get in um, the Inuit languages is that the object doesn't just move up to an outer specifier of little VP. Instead, it moves up to somewhere in the, in the periphery. It moves past the subject. Then we have a version of the dependent case rule that's very similar to the one for Saha. It assigns dependent case downward to the lower of two DPs inside the CP phase. But since object movement puts the object above the subject, the lower of the two DPs is actually the subject. So we get dependent case assigned to the subject, not to the object. And so we call it ergative. And the really cool thing that Michelle shows is that the, this, this variation, so this is what you get in, the, in, in, in examples that have ergative uh, absolutive case patterns, but you also in these languages get uh, transitive clauses that don't have the ergative marking. And you get a nice correlation. When you get the ergative marking, there's independent evidence for the movement of the object from things like scope and NPI licensing. And when you don't get the ergative marking, there's evidence that the movement hasn't taken place. And the nice thing is that the, the languages um, show evidence that the conditions for the syntactic movement vary, right? So one language has more movement of objects than the other and concomitantly has more ergative marking than the other. So these languages are all, let's say differential subject marking, right? They have sometimes ergative marking, sometimes not, right? Um, they have different variants of it and those different variants correlate with the independent syntactic properties of the language. So this is a nice result. This kind of theory lets us have a nice explanation for the different kinds of case patterns we see and how they relate to the syntax of the languages involved. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that in the synthesis that I'm working on here, um, the, the, the majority of, of, of DPs that get a structural case get some sort of de dependent case. And if dependent case isn't assigned, if a DP doesn't meet the conditions for any dependent case rule or any other kind of inherent case uh, context that we'll talk about in a second, then it'll get default case or unmarked case. Um, and there's again, a lot of work on this and 
an idea that uh, will play a bit of a role later is that uh, I think it's it, it it's worthwhile um, to think about default case not as something that's supplied as an elsewhere, but as the actual lack of case, right? So in a language that has default nominatives, nominative is the literal lack of case. There's no case there at all. This will be useful for us going forward. Okay, so that's the that's the way that the analysis is going to work. Now I'm going to try to show you how we can use it to explain the differences between structural and inherent cases. And in doing so, I'll flesh out bits of the proposal that I haven't gotten a chance to talk about. So <clears throat> first difference, inherent case is thematically and lexically restricted. Structural case is assigned purely on the basis of structural configuration. The, the synthesis, which I'm calling synth here for short, gives a, a really straightforward characterization of the difference between structural and inherent case. This is not, we don't have to make a definitional distinction. Instead, we can make use of something that we already have in the theory. So structural case marked nominal phrases are just DPs. Inherent case marked ones are bigger than DPs, they're KPs, DP plus one or more heads. Now, this distinction between DP and KP or distinction between DPs and larger um, nominal extended projections right, is something that we need anyway for prepositional phrases and things like that. So um, it's not exactly a new bit of the theory or at least it's not new machinery, right? It's something that we need anyway. Now. This is going to automatically deal with the semantic thematic differences between the two different types of case. If inherent case marked nominals have extra heads on top of the DP, those heads can be expected to make some sort of semantic contribution. Might be um, irregular, but it should be there, right? So this is going to help us uh, account for the basic thematic restrictions that we see on, on, on uh, on uh, inherent cases. It also gives us a way to talk about things like semantic case or um, the, the use of, of inherent case mark DPs as adjuncts, right? Um, which makes sense if these things are not just DPs, but something bigger, right? So they don't have the syntactic distribution just of DPs, but of something more like PPs. Now, a really important thing that comes out of this is that inherent case, this way of thinking about things means that inherent case is never actually assigned. It's not determined for a DP in the course of the derivation. You don't have a DP and then in the course of the derivation decide that it's going to be dative or uh, locative or whatever. Instead, it really is inherent to the nominal phrase that it appears on, right? Um, so in other words, you build up as you're, as you're building up a nominal phrase, you build it up to the point of being a dative or a genitive or an ablative. And only then do you merge it into the larger structure, right? Now, what this means is that we can have the determination of inherent cases, what you might call assignment of inherent case, actually just boils down to something like C selection. Okay, so let's say that um, again we can use sort of little variables for the 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 the, K, the different KP heads in the Taha style system. Let's say that Y is the head that defines dativs, and X is the head that defines genitives. Right, so Y is going to be above X. Um, we can then use that to define the following for a, a, a set of German verbs that traditionally we would say assign inherent case. So tragen, carry doesn't assign an inherent case. It just takes an object that will get structural accusative case. So we just say that tragen selects for DPs, which we would, is what we would normally say. But a verb like helfen, which means help and assigns an inherent dative, it doesn't assign anything what it does is it selects for YPs. It selects for things that already have the structure that corresponds to dative rather than just a simple DP. And a verb like Gedenken, which uh, assigns inherent genitive actually selects for uh, another size of, uh, of structure XP. Um, I think this is a welcome result because inherent case assignment is, uh, is the sort of thing that is somewhat sort of predictable, shows some consistent patterns in a particular language that I, I particular inherent case will go with a certain kind of thematic uh, role or a certain kind of semantics, but it's full of exceptions, right? It's not the sort of thing that's actually predictable. Um, and that is kind of exactly what we expect with C selection, right? The kinds of verbs that C select a particular kind of complement, there are often sort of patterns that you can define, but there are tons and tons of lexical exceptions. And so it's nice that we can assimilate inherent case to that. 
Structural case mark nominals just don't have any such heads. They're just DPs. So they can't have any consistent semantics. Nominatives and accusatives are the same syntactic structure. So we can't have any generalizations about what they mean. They also will have a restricted distribution. They can't show up in places where PPs show up and they won't be visible to selection. So there's no way to have um, a, a verb that, that assigns inherent nominative. That's a good result. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through the, the rest of these quickly for time reasons, because I want to make sure to get to some of the later stuff. Um, what comes here is mostly follows pretty straightforwardly. So why is it that when both could be assigned inherent case, we'll take precedence over structural case? Well, it's for what I just said. If inherent case is not assigned, right? A DP that's going to get inherent case enters the derivation, is first merged with the larger structure already as the KP with that particular case size. That's not something that can be modified later on in the morphology. If you wanted to take a, a, a dative in this system and turn it into a nominative, you would have to actually sub-extract the DP out of the larger KP that is the dative structure, something that generally doesn't happen, right? Um, this also explains the third difference, why it is that inherent cases don't alternate under A movement, right? If you were to move something around, you won't be able to eliminate the KP structure. You also won't be able to create KP structure by movement um, or argument structure alternations, right? Whereas dependent cases can absolutely be modified, be, be, be uh, altered or, or, or undergo alternations based on A movement and argument structure. Because if you move something around or you um, change the number of arguments that are present, that's obviously going to have an effect on the dependent case rules. We've already seen examples of that from Baker and Yuan's work. Um, and I would just want to point out very quickly, it, this is something that this approach derives. Whereas traditional approaches, even though this difference, this, the fact that structural cases alternate under A movement and inherent ones don't. This was the foundational distinction between the two, the, the main diagnostic for telling them apart. But the way that the case theory dealt with it was just definitional, just by saying inherent case is assigned early and structural case is assigned late. That was it. Now we don't have to make that a definitional thing. Um, it's because inherent case and structural case are two rather different things that have a different structural status. Okay, I'm going to skip over the, the bit about um, quirky case because that's not particularly relevant for today's concerns. Uh, I will say something briefly about why it is that um, inherent versus structural case matters for the case of something below it. And um, I think to show you this, I'll just jump ahead. Um, so what we want to what we want to explain, actually, I'll show you the, the relevant example here. What we want to explain is why. If you have two DPs with structural case, it'll come out as nominative accusative. So the lower one will get accusative in a language like German. But if the higher of the two DPs has inherent case, the result is inherent and then nominative. The object gets nominative and not accusative. Why would that be? So this is the relevant structure. In the proposal that I've got here, the inherent case marked subject is not a DP, it's a KP. The object is a DP. Now, if you've got a dependent case assignment rule that says, if you've got two DPs in a C command relationship assign dependent accusative to the lower of them, well, that rule can't apply here. We've got two DPs, but they're not in a C command relationship. The KP C commands the object, but the DP contained inside does not, right? So the conditions for the, uh, for the dependent case rule aren't met. And so we don't get dependent, case, dependent accusative assigned to the lower object. Um, there's some interesting stuff there about how we can how this lets us deal with comparative differences. There are some languages where you still get dependent accusative in that context. And the nice thing is this, this approach gives us a way to talk about that so that we can get the difference between Icelandic, Faroese, and uh, Tamil. Um, last one is about agreement. And here I will, do I have a tree for this? I don't. Um, there's a very straightforward story about this, uh, which uh, was already proposed by uh, Milan Rejac in a paper from 2008. Um, if inherent case marked nominals are KPs, 
And we assume that the KP is something like a prepositional phrase and creates a locality boundary, then the, uh, the five features on the DP contained inside will not be accessible to agreement relationship, for relationships. And there are interesting details, again, about dealing with comparative differences, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so now um, the real payoff though, so what I've just what I've just given you there, that way of, of putting things together, there's a couple of things that are not that are somewhat novel in this story that had to do with um, why it is that we don't get uh, the dependent the the inherent cases changing under a movement and 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 also the basic defini definitional difference between structural and inherent. Um, other than that, a lot of the other things that you'll notice, I was citing earlier work and saying, okay, the story that we've got here lets us take over. Bejach's story about agreement, um, or a story that Baker had about um, uh, about um, why you do and don't get um, accusative below uh, inherent things. So, so up until this point, I'm largely putting together previous work. Where the real payoff comes is if we look at some intermediate things, some things that are somewhere in between structural and inherent, and at first glance, these should be a big problem for synth, for my synthesis. My synthesis says that structural cases are DPs, inherent cases are KPs. Those are two clearly very different things. So there should be a clear cutoff between the two cases. The problem is there are case categories in a number of well-known languages that straddle the divide between structural and inherent. Um, I'm going to summarize the, 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 the evidence here very quickly. Um, so there's three different places where I, at least where I've seen this. Um, the first one comes from irregular morphological forms that you get. Um, this is a, a, a pattern, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the tree here. If we look, sorry, the, uh, the table here, we look at the Tamil example, there's a lot of languages that have a pattern like this where you get a, an irregular stem form in the nominative and then another completely different stem form, stem forming suffix in all of the other cases. And then the case markers get attached to that, that suffix. Um, Latin does it, Icelandic does it, lots of languages do this. And the weird generalization is that it's always the nominative versus everything else. Um, there are some caveats that can, that some, some systematic exceptions to this, but that's the basic generalization. And the problem with that for our current purposes is that that makes it seem like the nominative is one thing and the accusative goes together with the genitive, the dative, the locative, the instrumental, the ablative, all of the other fun um, uh, oblique cases. And the problem is that's the wrong cutoff. If we want the structural cases to go one way and the inherent cases to go another way, because the accusative doesn't go together with the nominative, even though in Tamil and, and Latin and Icelandic, accusative is a, is a structural case. It goes together with the inherent cases. That's a bit of a worry. The second pattern um, is even more problematic. Specific cases like the accusative show, which are clearly structural cases in a language like German, have some clearly inherent uses. So there are a number of one place verbs in German that assign accusative to their only argument. So mich friert, mich dürstet. Mich friert means literally me freezes, but it's I'm freezing or I'm cold. Um, there's no way that structural dependent case could be assigned here because there's no second DP to trigger it. So we've got an acute, we've got accusative, even though the accusative elsewhere in the language is structural here, it's behaving as inherent. That's a problem. And the third problem um, comes from syncretism. If structural and inherent cases are two completely different beasts, then we should expect there to be, them to be treated separately by syncretism patterns, but that's not the way that it works. Saha shows that if you look at a language like Russian, and this generally goes for any language that you, that you can set up this kind of pattern for, you get um, syncretisms affecting basically every adjacent pair of cases on the hierarchy. There's no point where you get a clear break where you could say, ah, okay, this side is structural, this side is inherent. The problem is, in Saha's story, the way to deal with the syncretism patterns crucially depends on KP structure. Now, if 
everything that's inherent has KP and everything that's structural doesn't have KP, there should be no way to have a syncretism that has one structural case and one inherent case. But you get that all over the place. So what do we do? Okay, now I'm almost out of time. So I'm gonna give you the really quick version of what I think is going on here. Um, and since I have to do it faster, it makes the unorthodox proposal even more crazy, which is I think a good thing. So what we need, the facts that are out there, what, what, what we need here is not a two-way distinction, right? My theory so far has a two-way distinction between structural and inherent, but actually what we need is a three-way distinction. In a, in a typical nominative accusative language, we need the nominative case, which, is, which clearly has evidence for no structure whatsoever. It looks like a straight up DP. We need a third category for the inherent cases, which very clearly have KP structure, everything that they do, is consistent with that. And then we never need a, an intermediate category for all of the other structural cases aside from the nominative. So the accusative, maybe also the dative in um, ergative absolutive languages, at least a lot of them, the ergative would go here, which according to certain things look like they should have structure and certain other things look they should, like they should not have structure. And the way that I wanna account for this is by, um, saying something about how it is that dependent case is actually implemented. And this is something that theories of dependent case have left largely, as far as I can tell, uh, underspecified. So what is it that happens when um, a DP gets assigned dependent case? A typical traditional idea would be to say, well, you add some case features to it. But if you do that, uh, you lose, if you do that in the world that we're living in right now in this talk, you lose the ability to talk about syncretism in a useful systematic way. So that's not going to work for us. So what I'm going to say instead is that the, design, the assignment of dependent case literally amounts to the addition of KP structure on top of what was a simple DP, but late in the derivation. So this is how we get a three-way distinction. Nominatives or the, the whatever case is completely unmarked, right, starts out in, at first merge as a DP goes through all of syntax as a DP, makes it to spell out as a DP, right? An inherent um, case, including inherent uses of the accusative will be a DP plus the head that defines accusatives from first merge, right? It'll go through all of the syntax as that. It'll make it to spell out as that. And it'll be treated in, by, by the morphology as a DP plus an A head. Dependent accusatives and all other structural cases that involve uh, that involve something more than just the unmarked case. They start out the first merge as DPs. They go through all of the syntax as DPs. At the, at the post spell out point when dependent case assignment rules apply, they get the extra head added on. And so they make it into the morphology as DPs plus the A head. So the syntax treats nominatives and dependent accusatives the same and different from inherent case marked DPs. The morphology treats dependent accusatives and inherent accusatives the same, that's what we want, and nominatives as separate. So this gives us exactly what we want. Now, um, let, me, let me give you some things to worry about why this is maybe a bad idea. And then um, in maybe in the question period, I can tell you something more about why I think it's not such a bad idea. So this is a very weird thing to do because, so saying the dependent case involves adding KP structure at spell out or after spell out, adds structure at a weird time in a weird place in a weird way, All right? So adding material after spell out violates the inclusiveness condition. Adding new syntactic heads onto phrases that have already been merged into a larger structure violates the extension condition and cyclicity. And, um, we still haven't solved the problem of how to implement dependent case assignment using operations that fit with the rest of the theory. Something that I, I alluded to briefly, which is that we can't do dependent case assignment with agree. Agree takes two objects that are kind of similar and makes them more similar to each other by copying the features of one under the other or something like that. Dependent case does the opposite. It takes two things that are very similar to each other and makes them a bit different. Agree can't do that. So we need another operation that can compare, grab these two things, decide that they're, let's say, too similar, and then do this funny operation of adding extra KP structure onto one of them. Um, and I have two quick suggestions about how that might work. 
the these two initial objections, I think, go away once we think carefully about how about the timing of this. This is why it's a good thing, I think, that this is happening in the morphology. Um, the post spell out portion of the derivation doesn't care about inclusiveness or the extension condition or cyclicity, at least not in this particular way. So we can ignore those. In terms of how we actually implement things, what I want to suggest is if, um, if you think about what a structural accusative is, right? It's a DP, that's the nominative, plus one extra head. Now, what if that's generally what dependent case is? It's you take a, a, a nominal structure and you add the next head, not, not just any old head, but the next head in the extended projection. So let's say that the operation of, 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 of making a nominative into an accusative, let's say, is by cranking through one, one, one repetition through extended projection. Um, there's, there are some arguments out there that this is something that we want, that we need an operation for, right? We need an op, we, or either, an op, uh, either a dedicated operation or at least um, let's say a list like a functional sequence or a hierarchy of projections in order to implement um, extended projection. If that's, if that's correct, then we could actually use it to implement dependent case assignment. The nice thing here is that res it restricts what looks like a crazy idea of saying, oh, we'll just, we'll just throw in KP heads at spell out. That's a bad idea. A better idea is, oh, we will do one very, very restricted operation um, at spell out. You take a DP and you crank it up to the next level of its projection. That's the only thing you can do. You can't get rid of heads. You can't add random other heads. You can't put heads in random places. All you can do is take something and crank it up to the next level of its, of its, of its extended projection. That gives us a restrained theory of um, dependent case assignment. And the very last comment that I'll make and then I'll stop is about the triggering of dependent case. This is sort of replacing part of what agree would, would be supposed to do here, right? Um, there's a, and, this, and this is basically a shameless plug for a, a project that I, I have uh, going with uh, a bunch of smart people in Edinburgh, Göttingen and, and, and SAS, looking at locality and selective opacity and argument adjunct distinctions. And in particular, we're, we're working on this idea that locality might be defined in terms of accessibility paths set up by paths of selection and extended projection rather than just having domains like phases. Um, and uh, if you uh, saw Kenyon Brennan's uh, uh, poster at Nell's uh, last week or the week before, um, he took this and uh, applied it to some really interesting facts about dependent case, uh, which gives us a nice explanation for why in some languages, adjuncts can get assigned dependent case. So an adjunct can get dependent case because there's a higher subject, but they can't count as competitors to license dependent case assigned on other DPs. Uh, and this comes out of the idea that um, what you need here is locality in the sense of a path. And these paths are defined by selection and because they're paths rather than just being domains, they can be asymmetric. So you can have A be local to B without B being local to A. Okay, thank you, I'll stop there. Okay, very interesting stuff. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, and as he announced, we have a first class discussion today. Our discussion is Michelle Yuan, who is an assistant professor at uh, UC San Diego. She specializes in syntax, morphology, and fieldwork, and has undergone research, undergone, sorry, research on the interaction of case, agreement, and movement, among other topics. So she's the perfect candidate to discuss this. Uh, presentation. Thanks a lot for being here, Michelle. You can start whenever you're ready. Okay, well, first of all, um, can you hear me fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to first say thanks uh, to Tom for this very interesting talk. I also wanted to say thank you to the moderator and also thank you to the organizers uh, for putting this together. Um, you know, as I said, this is a really cool talk, lots of empirical coverage, and I have a lot of questions, um, as you might imagine. Um, so I guess I'll just start off. Um, so my first question is, um, I'm kind of just wondering about the predictions that you might be making um, with regards to your distinction between uh, morphological dependent case versus syntactic inherent case in terms of how they might interact with other processes that we might think 
um, are syntactic. So for example, syntactic movement. Um, so in particular, um, you know, you showed in your talk that there are certain kinds of movement that do feed case dependent case assignments. So obviously there's the object shift stuff from Saka. There's also the, you know, the references to what I've done with Inuit. But at the same time, there are other kinds of um, movement that I think people tend to think are not necessarily able to um, feed uh, dependent case assignments. So I think in particular, I'm thinking about A-bar movement, right? Um, so at the same time, though, um, there, so in addition to a bar movement, I guess, generally not being able to feed dependent case assignment, there are also mentions in the literature of a bar movement actually being able to be sensitive to case distinctions. Um, obviously, one kind would be the ergative extraction restriction, but there have been some other things that have appeared in the literature here and there, and we can, you know, maybe talk more about like other specific kinds of things that have, that have been brought up in that respect. But I guess my question to you is really just what, um, I guess, kinds of predictions you would make in terms of the ways in which a bar movement can or cannot actually be sensitive to the case of a DP that's undergoing a bar movement. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's a um, that's a very hard question. Um, so that's 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 a very good question. So th this is something that I've worried about for a long time, and I don't have a very good answer to it. I have a, a basically a bunch of speculation. So um, so this is one of the things that has um, led people to say actually it's a bad idea to have this be done in the morphology. Um, <laughs> It's a better idea to say that dependent case is done, let's say at an intermediate stage of the syntactic derivation after a movement is done and before a bar movement happens. That's a totally plausible story. Um, the, um, I, I, so there's a, there's a weak thing that I can say, which is that it's not a, I don't think it's a knockdown argument. So, it's not the case that you uh, can't compute dependent case after a bar movement has taken place. That would only be true if we didn't have access to earlier copies of movement. And since we assume that we do, um, I'm not too worried about that. Um, so I think that it's not a problem. Yeah, I think that's the way to say it. From my, from my, for, for my approach, it's not a problem that a bar movement that there, are, that there are lots of languages where a bar movement does not feed or bleed dependent case assignment. What's more worrisome for my theory is that there are so few languages that where it does matter. So it seems like my theory should make it, should, should lead to the prediction that at least some languages might care about that. Um, and um, so one thing that, um, that we can say let me think about, so, so one, one thing that can be said to, to deal with this is to say, okay, um, whatever the, the features are that are relevant for um, A movement versus A bar movement, these are the kinds of features that the dependent case category rules, let's say, are defined in terms of. So um, the dependent case rule has that, that that variable for a category, which can be a DP, or if we listen to Baker, it can be a DP or it can be a PP. Uh, the version that I've got here, it could be a DP or it could be some flavor of KP. And the, the, the suggestion that I would have to pursue is that a movement also cares about DP slash KP slash PP. Whereas a bar movement doesn't care about that at all. A bar movement instead cares about let's say WH or top or whatever these other, these other class of features. Um, that's not an explanation by a long shot, it's a, but it's a, something on which an explanation, explanation could be based. So what we'd have to say is that the, um, the domains that are set up by a movement, um, no, a different way to say that, the domains, that ca the domains and categories the case cares about are ones that simply are completely orthogonal to a bar movement. And so um, let's say that the copies of something in an a bar position are simply invisible um, because it's not seeing. So, okay, let me, let me make a specific and almost certainly wrong version of this so that it's easier for easier to, to, to nail me down. Let's say that um, if you've got a deep a WHDP 
um, the copy of the WHDP that ends up in spec CP actually doesn't have, does, its DP features are not accessible. Instead, what you see are the WH features. And mm -hmm. so the dependent case rule just doesn't see that copy or is at least is allowed to ignore that copy. I think mm -hmm. that would be the kind of the kind of way that I'd have to go here. Um, my excuse, yeah, I don't, so feel free to respond to that before I say anything worse. Uh huh. So I guess um, I know that there is some recent work by uh, Ethan Poole at UCLA, and actually I think also Stefan kind of um, also at UCLA with regards to kind of trying to um, understand that lack of interaction, not in terms of features like WH features, um, but more so in terms of like structure. So I, I know they make reference to, like the Williams cycle and kind of like kind of be, you know. So maybe that might kind of be one different way of accounting for that but i guess i was actually more concerned about the other issue which is that there has been claimed to be a bar movement that is crucially case discriminating so it's not even just that um oh, right okay yeah, yeah yeah right right okay i think that i i hope that that's a little bit easier for me to deal with mm -hmm. um so uh so what I, so because the okay i make a prediction that a bar movement can only be case can only actually be case discriminating um, to the extent that it discriminates between um, different sizes of nominal phrases. So it can distinguish uh, DPs from KPs, and it can distinguish among the different sizes of KPs. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is also the way that uh, this is also the way that this account lets us talk about quirky case. So if we say that, um, let's just say the datives are, are I don't know, BPs, right? Let's say the dative is, is two heads above um, the nominative. Um, what you say then is that in, um, in German, uh, the, 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 the very syntactic rules that deal with subjecthood refer specifically and only to DPs. Whereas in Icelandic, um, they refer to, maybe they refer to BPs or they refer to, um, uh, nominal extended projections in an underspecified way, and therefore can apply to both of them. You could, so you could do the same thing then for WH movement, you could, or for for a bar movement. You could say that an a bar movement in a particular language um, is restricted to applying to DPs and not to uh, BPs, right? Mm -hmm. So it couldn't apply to datives. It could only apply to um, uh, it could only apply to uh, nominatives. That makes a prediction that it again it should not care about structural case differences, and that means that you can't use that to account for um, restrictions on extracting ergatives, mm -hmm. unless unless the language has an inherent ergative, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you if you if you go along, if you if you take the sort of medium road where lots of languages have structural ergatives, lots of other languages have inherent ergatives, then you could say, okay, the inherent ergatives could be blocked from WH movement because they're a different size than absolutives. I don't know that that's a very good story. So the other alternative is I think to just go with your story, if, if to say that this only happens in languages with syntactic ergativity, where the ergative absolutive distinction is just following the structural, the difference in the structural height of the DPs, Right, and so this is like, this is the same. So uh, before I go off on the tangent, so the 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 reason why you can't extract ergatives is not because they're marked ergative, but because they are um, because the object is has moved across them, and then you get a you get some sort of minimality or whatever other problem with the with the movement because of that. That movement also triggers ergative, but the so both ergative and the ex and the extraction problem are caused by the same thing; mm -hmm. they don't cause each other. I see. Understood. I will say though that um, what you had described previous uh, previous to that though um, is very similar in spirit, I think, to Masha Polinsky's work on syntactic ergativity versus morphological ergativity. So specifically, her book. Um, she actually, if I remember correctly, um, argues that in syntactic ergative, syntactically ergative languages, the ergative must actually be something like a PP 
Whereas in morphologically ergative languages with no such extraction restriction that you're actually dealing with DPs. So it's possible that actually there was like a version of that would, which would actually be compatible with what you were, uh, what, what your account is predicting um, in terms of the, so it could be that maybe for some languages you can kind of use the, um, like the locality or I guess the minimality um, restrictions to account for the extraction restriction, but maybe for some other cases you could actually appeal to the distinction between inherent and structural. As well right right exactly yeah and i think something like that is pro i mean at some levels probably right i mean again this is the the point that uh, omer makes in this 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 paper that just because you call two things ergative doesn't mean at all that they're the same thing and so things that look similar restrictions restrictions on movement relating to case might have two very different explanations if the things that we call ergative have two completely different sources Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I do have a few other questions, but um, Carlos, I'm not sure if there are also questions in the chat or how we should proceed in that respect. There are no questions in the chat right now, and I just have a very, you know, shallow comment, so you go ahead. Me? Okay, sure. So um, I had um, some more clarificational questions. So for example, um, you had mentioned um, like differential case marking as potentially just being versions of dependent case, um, but maybe like interacting with movement in various ways. But there are, I guess, also kinds of, um, you know, um, differential case markings that uh, don't necessarily track specificity or scope or things like that, but maybe might be sensitive to animacy or like person or other kinds of more almost like syntax semantic -y types of things, I guess, distinctions. So I was kind of curious how, um, like, I guess I was curious as to what you might think of those. Like, do you want to take so, those? Yeah, so, I, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think again, like this is this is another case where there are probably multiple explanations are correct for different languages, right? So or for different patterns. So I think um, some of the those types of things also um, work as uh, can be understood independent terms. So one, so okay, so so here's one kind of weirdish. I don't know if it's weird. One kind of really cool example, I think, and I can't think of a language that does this, but I, there are out. Uh, I don't have a, an example ready to hand. Um, if you have languages where uh, the differential uh, object marking is person-based, there's, and actually it's quite possible that Baker even says this somewhere. I feel like this isn't my idea, but I, I can't remember now exactly. Um, if, if you think that um, the, the different persons are in a structural containment relationship, so for example, let's say that um, uh, second person is built is, is basically a DP plus a participant head. And then first person is a second person plus, plus so that's the participant plus a speaker head. Um, that means that you have different size. So even independent of, of what's going on case-wise, you've got different size things. And so you could have a, a dependent case rule that cares a lot about the fine details there. So, um, uh, so if you you could have a dependent case rule that says something like, if you have two participant P's in a C command relationship, assign dependent case to the lower one. Mm -hmm. That will only ever apply to first and second person pronouns. It will never apply to third persons because they don't they aren't participant P's, right? So that's a kind of thing that you can. So that that's a a, a different kind of dependent effect that you can get from that sort of thing. You could also do that for animacy, right? Where you would say that animate things. Um, you could have a dependent case rule that is sensitive to an animacy phrase or something like that. Um, and also it sets things up such that, I, I feel like I, I, I've, I worked this out at some point. Um, it, it means that something lower won't, you won't, count, won't count for the application of the rule. And also you can use the extra structure to keep something higher from counting for the application of rules in the same way that, um, uh, KP will encapsulate a DP. So if you have a dependent case rule that cares about DPs and you have the higher thing as is, is a DP embedded in a participant P, then you might not be able to get the rule triggered because the DP doesn't see command out of the participant P to see the lower thing. So mm -hmm. you can play around with things like that to get that kind of specific pattern. Um, I'm trying to think of, there's there are gonna be other ones that probably don't involve dependent case. Um, at the moment, I'm not, thinking of obvious 
uh, yeah, I'm not thinking of, uh, oh, uh, so, right, so, so things, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so, yeah, so, so what you can deal with in terms of dependent case is, is, is differential object marking that either can be attributed to different heights of movement or to different structural sizes of the, of the nominal phrases involved. If mm -hmm. none of that is what matters, then probably there should be a different story about what's going on. And in that case, then you would say, okay, that's not, we don't have a dependent case that's involved. Instead, there's um, some kind of other structural effect going on. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Okay, and I have one more question if that's okay, Carlos. It is. Okay, um, so my, my last question for now is, um, I guess, um, just a clarificational question about uh, morphological case. Um, so I guess oftentimes when we, not always, but of course, oftentimes when we talk about like M case, we're talking about case that happens to be morphologically exponed, like overly exponed that is, as opposed to zero. Um, and I guess I'm kind of just wanting to know um, under your system, uh, can you have like, distinctions between different cases where they are all zero. So as opposed to treating all zero cases as a form of nominative, but can there be a zero nominative and also a zero accusative uh, where you do apply the dependent case algorithm post tactically, but you just don't have, a, a, I guess, a morphological form that corresponds to one of them? I think, yeah, yeah, definitely you can have that. I mm -hmm. think that it's going to be reasonably rare because it's going to be very hard to, I mean, so assuming that you mean a, a pattern where like the, like the nominative and accusative are always null everywhere in, in a given language, right? That's mm -hmm. going to be hard to acquire. Okay, so yeah. So the system, the system allows it, but it'll be hard to acquire unless there is something else that, that tracks that. And this is where, mm -hmm. so like the, the cases where this, this sort of thing is plausibly going on are, are languages that have um, a phi agreement mm -hmm. that right right that seems that looks like it's tracking a case distinction that's never expressed on the nominals. So that the the, the phi agreement patterns would then provide the primary li linguistic um, data for for uh, acquirers to posit case features uh, in those. And I think that. I mean, I think there are some pr reasonably convincing cases of that going on. Um, there's a worry here uh, that I, I think that I, I know I've seen expressed um, that if you that this makes it sound like, um, you know, this is this is taken as an argument, sometimes taken as an argument for having these be syntactic features and not morphological features, um, which I can sort of understand, but I think it. It, it depends on a bit of a misunderstanding or a terminological imprecision that I'm at least as guilty of as anyone else. Um, the, the, the theory here of, of the schism part of this, the cases morphological thing, um, uh, does not, it, this is not a theory, the theory of, of cases as overt mm -hmm. affixes. It's a case of, there, these are still abstract features which then get exponed. Um, there's no so Julie Leggett has a has this the 2008 paper where she argues okay we need abstract features therefore it must be syntax I think that doesn't I think that argument doesn't follow the the this theory absolutely requires abstract features that then go through a a subsequent um, realization stage um, but those abstract features can be in the morphology they don't have to be in the syntax and part of the way to think about this is that when I say morphology. I mean, um, I don't mean, I mean, actually, a, what's more properly a relatively late stage of the syntax. Mm -hmm. So, right. So if we, if we have a theory like distributed morphology, there's a point where the, the right at or right after spell out, you've got a full-blown syntactic structure with hierarchy and C command and all of that. Um, and nodes that are just decorated with features, which then need to be dealt with somehow. And so the idea is of, of late case is, is at that point, it's not, it's long before anything like, like uh, vocabulary insertion. Um, this is the point where, where morphological case would be assigned, would be, would be added. Um, and so it's not actually, it's not problematic to say that it's, it's abstract. The, the argument against that would be to say, okay, we don't wanna have that much going on in the morphology, but there are lots of other areas of, theories of realization of morphosyntax that 
have a lot of work going on there. So I, I don't see it as, as, as a big problem, but yeah, that's, that's an important clarification. Definitely there are abstract things there. And, and, and we can see this very easily in languages that, um, that, that lots of Indo-European languages that um, there's clearly a distinction between say nominative and accusative, but there are lots and lots of inflectional classes that don't make that distinction where they both show up as a, as a, as a null affix. Um, but we know that the the difference is there underlyingly because it shows up in other classes, right? Mm -hmm, right, yeah. And of course, thinking about it from like an ergative perspective, this is, I guess, I was thinking about like not just a work by Julie Leggett, but also some recent work by Jessica Kuhn on the notion of like, um, you know, ergative agreement really tracking and perhaps like an ergative case feature that may not necessarily be overly exponed in the Mayan languages. And I, I think she also tries to extend this to. Um, unrelated languages too, like, for example, um, some Shianic languages and whatnot as well that are kind of have a similar profile. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, well, and that seems like that seems like the right analysis of that kind of facts to me, to me, at least to the extent that I understand them. So, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, it seems that we don't have questions from the chat. So, Michelle, do you have any other questions for Thomas? Um, I still do, but you said you had a question. So. Yeah, I I, I, I I bought the theoretical part, but I, it is going to sound very sceptic. Um, so if you're proposing, uh, you're proposing basically that there are two animals in the case kingdom, right? Shouldn't the repercussions of this more be more obvious? Like when I teach, inherent case and structural case to my students? Shouldn't it be more easy for me to explain that there are, for instance, syntactic uh, behaviors that are different because, well, you said it, it's one different projection in one case versus a DP in another case, right? Shouldn't be this have repercussions across, you know, the syntactic behavior of these elements? Shouldn't we expect, you know, very, a very obvious type of effect from this type of divide? Yeah, I mean, um, that's so. It, that's that's uh, that's kind of a, a lot of what I what I, I, I I'm worried about, or what I'm trying to deal with in that that section towards the end of the talk when I'm talking about the intermediate things. That there's there's a bunch of cases, bunch of places where you the theory, my, my, my story predicts a big difference that you don't see. You see instead this sort of smooth um, sh gradation from the nominatives towards the other end, right? And um, so I think, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have a, a, an especially clever answer to that aside from saying, so first of all, like, of course we can quibble about like, we do get differences between structural and inherent. That's the, 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 the things about, you know, whether or not things, um, can undergo certain types of movement and whether or not they alternate under 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 certain contexts. So I think the differences are there, and then we have to decide whether those are those differences are enough to match up with this big structural divide that I'm positing. And so I think the the best thing that I can say there is that this is what motivates um, ending up with a tripartition where um, you you have. Um, you have a bit of confusion between the two classes because um, there's because we tend to con we tend to conflate syntactic differences and morphological differences or morphophonological differences and so the point is that like from a syntactic from a syntactic standpoint we get a reasonably clear distinction between structural and inherent in terms of the contexts in which they alternate and um, their ability to undergo movement and, and selection and that sort of thing. The morphological differences are a bit more uh, blended, a bit more, uh, that's blended is not the right word, a bit more obscured. And I think that's because we have this intermediate category of, of, of dependent cases, which behave syntactically like the nominative, but, but, but morphologically more like, uh, or, or let, let me say that differently. They behave syntactically as structural cases, they behave, morphologically more like inherent cases. Um, and so that, I hope that that gives us enough, enough smudging there, right? To get what looks like sort of a Klein instead of a, um, instead of a, a clear bifurcation. But yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, the proposal is clearly uh, open to that objection and I have to, I have to just see whether I can be convincing. <laughs> 
Cool, thanks. So if there are no question, more questions, I think we can just, you have a question, Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, I just have one more question and then I'll stop. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, make sure I understood, because um, I don't know if you actually touched on this too much, is actually how FI agreement, a case discriminating FI agreement actually fits within to this. Um, so are you assuming that agreement is a post and tactic taking, or like, you know, taking place after both dependent and um, inherent case assignment or is are you taking it to be syntactic with maybe some certain kinds of post syntactic repercussions just because I mean I guess I'm just kind of trying to see where that fits because I, I guess on the one side we know that phi agreement can be sensitive to the case morphology of a DP in that you know it, that can prevent agreement from taking place but also we know that um, agreement can also kind of correlate with syntactic things like movement, you know, there's WH agreement and things like that too. So I'm kind of just trying to understand uh, where you might want to locate agreement. Yeah, okay, thank you. That's an excellent question. And I think I have three completely different answers to it that I um, have been sort of speculating about. So the, the my original answer to that would have been, oh, of course, agreement is um, is morphological. Um, you know, with this uh, 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 Bobolix paper from I think 2008, where he says, okay, look, um, there's evidence that case is morphological and there's evidence that agreement depends on case, therefore agreement must be morphological. Uh, and again, morphological in the sense that I mean here that it comes late in the syntax after spell out, but... Um, so that's what I, I have generally thought was correct. Um, I'm starting to wonder whether there's uh, so there's a there's a there's a sort of weakened version of that, which is that um, uh, and a number of people propose different ideas um, that that break down agreement into two steps, right? Um, like the Aurelian Nevins uh, book, for example. So where what you could say, you could you could tell a, a coherent story where you say that the um, the the creation of an agreement dependency happens in the syntax. And then the let's say the transfer of features or or the details of how that gets worked out happens actually later in the morphology. That second step happens later on. And so case discrimination, so you could have agree set up in the syntax um, and whatever the syntactic correlates are can be dealt with at that point. Um, but then um, the case discrimination portion of it could be handled um, in the morphology. That's, I don't know that that actually is a real good candidate because you, you'd have to set things up really carefully to deal with instances where it looks like Due to case discrimination, you don't agree with one thing, but instead you agree with the other, right? Case discrimination isn't just, oh, it's got the wrong case, so I'm going to be default. I'm going to, you know, go failed agreement. Instead, I agree with, I agree with the object instead of the subject. Uh, so that would actually require a theory where, you know, in um, what happens in the syntax is that say T agrees with always agrees with both the subject and the object, and then in the morphology you decide which set of five features get spelled out based on. Or get transferred and then and and then pronounced based on uh, case discrimination. You can tell a coherent story there, I'm sure, but it sounds complicated. So there's a third option which I've only really recently started thinking about. Um, which this what I was talking about today actually makes possible, and I this is very speculative. I don't I haven't worked out whether this actually makes the right cut, but it's possible to actually say that. Um, Case is more dependent case is morphological in the sense that I've been talking about here, but actually it turns out that agreement was always syntactic. Um, and yet you get with, with the patterns that look like case discrimination are actually because what you can discriminate is KP or is, is between different flavors of KP and DP. So in a language that only agrees with nominatives, what that means is it only can agree with DPs. You can't agree with any kind of KP. And a language that can agree with, let's say, nominatives and accusatives, but not datives, you can agree with you know, up to a certain size, but, but, but not any bigger. Um, that has um, one potential big advantage, depending on how you look at it, which is that it, um, it might diffuse arguments that people like uh, Omar Preminger have made to say that no, actually case really has to be syntactic because 
Um, he's got stuff in his dissertation in his book about um, uh, defective intervention where you get this, this court, basically uh, things are only able to move if they've been successfully, uh, I forget the term now, but they've been successfully probed for agreement. Um, and um, case discrimination leads to certain things not being able to be moved because they weren't able to be agreed with. And if that's the case, then movement depends on, 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 case, uh, on agreement, which depends on case. Therefore, since movement is syntactic, agreement and case both have to be syntactic, right? That's an argument that, that, that is out there. I could, so here's, 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 a, here's a, a speculation is to say, no, agreement doesn't depend on case. It depends on the structures that are present. So like I said, you can, you can probe things that are DPs or say have one K head above them, but you can't probe anything bigger than that. Um, and that's what, so that's what agreement depends on and that's what movement depends on, right? So the, the part of that argument that says that agreement has to be syntactic, that goes through. But the part that says that case, or at least structural dependent case is syntactic doesn't go through because that's computed separately. I think that's an interesting idea. It makes a very clear prediction which I haven't worked out, which is that um, case discriminating agreement should only care about the differences that are syntactic. So that means no language should actually have a, a rule that says you can agree with one structural case, but not another. So there shouldn't be a language that can agree. So like you can't, shouldn't be able to have a version of German where you can agree with nominatives, but not structural accusatives. And there are languages out there that I think you could describe in those terms, but it's not clear that you actually need that. That's the, that'll be thing that will be looked into. So, so the reason why, the, the, the thing is that it, it, it's true that in German, you never can agree with structural accusatives, but you don't actually need case discrimination to account for that. You can never agree with a structural accusative in German because a structural accusative will always have a structural nominative above it. And that will be a closer target for agreement with T. And so, Accusatives, so th th that would basically say accusatives are, are available for agreement. You just never get to them because there's always something closer. If that extends to all languages where you could plausibly say, you know, nominatives are agreement targetives, but not accusatives, then I could tell this story so that agreement could be syntactic, but case, at least dependent case, would still be post syntactic. That's a lot of steps of speculation, but. Um, right, think, yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. I mean, I think you're right that there are like a lot of different factors that should ideally kind of like weed it out, right? Because as you're saying, like maybe sometimes we could be kind of like conflating um, case discrimination uh, with, for example, locality conditions on agree anyway and kind of things like that. Um, so I think you're right that like once we kind of tease apart all these different potential factors that might lead to the appearance of a case discriminating language, then we can kind of see what's left and what kinds of patterns actually uh, there are. Mm -hmm. Further questions, Michelle? No. Okay, then I think we can call it the night for us, for some of us. One morning for me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for such an interesting talk. Thanks a lot, Michelle, for your thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you. thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Michelle. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. And thanks was, to yeah. the audience out there who I can't see. But uh, yeah. Okay. Bye.